My name's Anne Havard. I'm a member of the core group of the Scottish Laity Network. And tonight, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the final evening of our series Towards Pentecost 2022, listening and responding to the cry of the poor and the cry of the earth. And tonight we're discussing the Eucharist as an act of political subversion, a good provocative title. And the other good news is that our companion is Thomas O'Loughlin. However, as we gather, we remember that the people in Ukraine are still suffering. And so we'll begin with a prayer for them. And we'll also remember the people of Syria and Palestine and Iraq and Yemen and all those who are suffering from wars and violence. And when we think about that war in Ukraine and all those other wars and aggressive acts, which we don't hear about in the press, we remember those words of Pope Paul VI, if you want peace, work for justice. They were spoken 50 years ago. And when he said those words, there was dynamism and hope in the church, the people of God, we're embracing the insights of Vatican II. Thomas Merton saw the student revolts of 1968, which you may remember or not, as an outpouring of the spirit. And it was a time when liberation theology was being formulated and lived out. And someone who fully embraced that gospel message of peace and justice was Daniel Berrigan. He was a Jesuit priest, a poet, an anti-war and pro-life activist who spent much time being arrested. In fact, between 1970 and 1995, a quarter of his time was spent in prison. In 1973, Daniel Berrigan spoke at this Christian movement, Seeds of Liberation. He took the Book of Revelation as the basis for his talk, and he explored what it looked like to maintain sanity in the face of the beast. The beast being the powers and principalities governing the world fostering violence and seeking to destroy life. He said that the challenge is for the people of faith to form communities of resistance 
spaces in which it is possible to tell alternative truths and struggle for a better world. And he clearly stated that central to these communities is the need to be rooted in the word and in the bread. We have had to understand, and we still do not understand very well, that to read the Bible and to celebrate the Eucharist are strictly subversive activities when they are done correctly. We do them because we have to do them to exist. The Eucharist is a whole way of life. And so tonight we focus on the Eucharist as an act of political subversion. And we're really pleased that the Zaverian missionaries are co-badging this session. And now I welcome Hugh Foy. He will say a few words about them and then he will introduce Tom. Hugh. Hugh, you should see the option to unmute. I do apologise, a, a schoolboy earlier in these times of Zoom, I'll start again. As I've already said, I'm feeling very privileged to be here tonight, and firstly, I'd like to apologise on behalf of the Provincial of the Zavarians, Father Patrick Duffy, who, due to a recent bereavement, can't be with you and would like to be here. Zavarians are a small missionary order, and the recent chapter reaffirmed, as well as a missional dynamic, a commitment to work with the laity to try and nurture the participation in the life of in the life of the church in every aspect of lay people. But tonight we're very lucky to have Tom O'Loughlin with us. Mainly this introduction is, is to try and give us a, a sense of who Tom is. He's an old friend of the Scottish Lady Network, having spoken here previously. However, perhaps for the first time, justice alone requires um, an introduction to follow Tom's achievements, both in the world of academia and in the life of the church. Born in Dublin, Tom is a priest of the Diocese of Arundel and Brighton, and has had a distinguished career as professor of historical theology at the University of Nottingham. His early graduate and postgraduate studies took him to such institutions as the University College Dublin, St. Patrick's College Maynooth and the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies, amongst others. In obtaining postgraduate qualifications of MPhil and a PhD, Tom was to teach in his previous alma maters before taking up the post in theology at the University of Lampeter in Wales firstly, and then subsequently in Nottingham. Throughout his career, the nature of how theology is taught has been central to Tom's endeavours, arriving at an analysis that identified modes of communication that are central to theological discourse as a discipline. Tom's mapping of the transition of Christianity from a primarily oral environment to a book-based religion raised fundamental questions in how the gospel is proclaimed and communicated. And in turn, Tom has explored how the emergence of online and web communication impacts on contemporary communication and the discourse of theology in relation to the gospel message. Nurturing a distinctive style of historical theology, Tom himself describes so well himself his fundamental task as a theologian when he says, I face each day the key challenges of the university researcher. On the one hand, one must be constantly seeking new knowledge by investigating historical material and subjecting well-known materials to new critical examination. On the other hand, communicating the fruits of one's research, training the next generation of researchers through supervising their studies. And transmitting the dialogue of theology through this teaching. The task of communication, therefore, is also complex in that one has to dialogue with others in a research community through the norms of publication and academic papers, but one must also communicate with the wider public for theology and its history is kind of concerned far beyond the academy through other publications and media. 
So this commitment to communicate to a wider public inside and outside the church was conducted through the period in the church in Tom's academic life, where internally we were confronted by a closing down of dialogue when it became increasingly difficult to offer critical yet committed analysis. Tom, however, was able to produce work of stature that continued to inform the dialogue of the wider conversation of the Catholic community, but also to bring a historical nuance that invited deeper reflection in both our own story and how contemporary understandings of that story were shaped by the questions of the past and the new questions emerging in the life of the church. Father John Baldwin, the Jesuit, in reviewing Tom's book, The Eucharist Origins and Contemporary Understanding, states, he fearlessly confronts the major questions confronting Eucharist theology in the course of Christian history, and no doctrine has spared his critical investigation. So imbued with this fearlessness that Baldwin rightly names, for Tom, historical theology has its basis in the reality of change, exploring what any group of Christians now or in the past profess, and how they imagine the world and their place in it through the lens of change. Historical theology investigates this phenomenon, the factors that lead to specific changes and developments, and how as groups we then realign new perspectives on Christianity with the past. Tonight, Tom will talk to us on the Eucharist as an act of political subversion. On hearing that title, I was struck yet again in my work with his viewing community that the Eucharist is an act of solidarity that envisions salvation as participation in God's love and God's beloved community. The Eucharist is where we bring our bodies to the table with our struggles, personal, social and political, and with all the real life implications of our Christian discipleship. I'm sure Tom will help us once again as a community to explore the Eucharist as an act that imbues us with the grace for participation in the political subversion our world so drastically needs. His is a faith always seeking understanding, a faith that still believes that the gospel message can still make and shape connections with public discourse on the issues that matter. And I'm sure we're all glad that once again, we have the opportunity to benefit from his learning on wisdom. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, you. The problem with an introduction like that is that anything I subsequently say is going to be a disappointment. So let me disappoint you right now at the beginning and tell you this. I don't, don't intend to refer to any phenomenon in the church later than 200 in the common era. So for the next 30 minutes, we're just going to look at history. I'm not going to try and put a theological slant on it. I'm just going to give you images from history and I will try to give you verbally footnotes to where you can go off and read about them for yourself. And then I'm going to invite you to think about the history and to think about your own experience and see is there a mismatch. And if there's a mismatch, then you have a real theological question. So the theology is now over. We're just going to look at some details. Probably writing between 180 and 200, one of the least known of the early Christian Latin writers, a man named Manucius Felix, a lawyer who later was martyred, was very proud of the fact that Christians didn't waste time trying to buy God's favor with sacrifices. An idea which he thought was humanly daft and was insulting to the very idea of God. And he summed it up in a lovely little phrase, we have neither sacred groves nor altars. Now, the unfortunate thing is that because he said that, he made sure that he was put in the second squad of early Christian writers. And while everyone knows that Tertullian is the father of Latin theology, 
few know that Manuchius Felix was probably there 20 or 30 years before him. We have neither sacred groves nor altars. And remember, every middle class house in the Roman Empire had at least one altar and probably several. And if you go into any classical museum, you can see basic altars about the size of a shoebox. You can see the more upmarket ones with nice carvings. And you can even find super duper altars, which could take liquid offerings, glass of wine to the gods, you know, can't do any harm. You never know what might happen tomorrow. And you could also combine them and have a little fire. So you could get the, the the average multi-purpose, you'll in any classical museum, you'll find the upper middle class multi-purpose altar. And they, they could be bought in Rome in the classical equivalent of Ikea. The curious thing is that in all our ancient sources, whether it's Paul, Pseudo-Paul, other New Testament letters like Jude, the Gospels or other writings, and that's the whole range of the Gospels, uh, not just our four canonical Gospels, we are struck by the fact that while Jesus visits the temple and clearly had a deep respect as a, as a, as a pious rabbi in the Second Temple, in Second Temple Judaism for the temple, he assumes that his community will assemble for prayer, not in the temple, but around a table. And that's very interesting because it supposes that any place that a group of Christians gather, group of disciples gather, that place is a place where God can be interacted with. Think about it. Judaism was utterly fascinated by the role of the temple. Here was the place that God's presence was available. Here was the place where the people of Israel, through a priesthood, could lay out morning and evening their offerings of praise and thanksgiving in the form of a meal. We even know the quantities of beer and bread and meat that were served every day on the altar in Jerusalem. And yet we get this statement in John's Gospel the time is coming when it won't be on that mountain or on this mountain, but in spirit and in truth. So Christianity emerges as a very secular religion. The whole world is potentially holy. And no place can claim that particular holiness that would denigrate the rest of the creation. It's wherever the two or three people gather, that is the place which becomes the temple. This is the place where people can stand before God and pray and intercede for themselves and for the, for the, and for the nation and mankind. And it's there that they will know God's love. Now, of course, table prayers are central to Judaism, but they're seen as dependent on the yet greater table that's taking place in the temple in Jerusalem. Curiously, the community in Qumran, placed down on the Dead Sea, hottest and nastiest place you could imagine to live on earth. They had decided that the temple was no longer pure 
and they were no longer following the true calendar and therefore the temple was literally out of sync with the creation and so with the creator and so they had their own ritual down down at the shores of the dead sea and they had decided that their community table would be the altar in the temple and they imagined their refectory as the equivalent of the temple. But they're, uh, they're, um, these, the, 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 these are religious, the, the, these, the, the, this is the equivalent of, of Cistercianism. And clearly Jesus was very influenced by Qumran and clearly he had the deepest understanding of Qumran. He, that, that relationship there with the Baptist, who's very close in many ways to the Qumran community. But he says, you don't have to go off and live in the Dead Sea. You don't have to cut yourself off. You don't have to become this, these, these 24 hour religious. Pache, Hugh Foy there in the Severian Brothers, who's you know, a 24 hour specialist. Any community around the table can become the beloved community of God and that table becomes their altar. That table becomes the place where they encounter God. Now that is very subversive, not only of the structure of Second Temple Judaism, but it's deeply subversive of Roman state religion, where attendance in the local temple is a way of declaring yourself to be a loyal citizen. You go to the temple and it says, it's a bit like having your passport stamped. You would worship in your own city's temple. You're welcome to do a new city by welcoming, by going into its temple. And in going into the temple, you declare that you're a man of the Pax Romana. You belong to the big society. You understand the way the world works and you work with it. And equally, you go into a house and there's the altar set apart. The altar to one set of gods, the household gods, the the Lares and the Penates, the ones who keep the family heart together, to the other gods. But there's no pouring of libations, no burning, no destruction of anything in the Christian liturgy. It's very simple. It's words addressed to God. And it's in that sense that Manuchius Felix has we are so intimate with God, we don't need all this, 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 this hassle. We eat together instead. Of course, there were others, just at the same time, around the same time as Manuchius Felix, there's a Greek bishop, Ignatius. He's terrified that the Christians will be seen as atheists. They don't go to the temples. They don't have temples in the house. Did you go into that Christian household? It didn't even have a didn't even have an altar in the in the dining room. My God, what sort of weird people are these? You know, this is, you know, shades of Islamophobia. And and unfortunately, he he, he comes up with a what he must have thought was a genius answer at the time. Our tables are our altars wouldn't take very long before our altars became our tables and we ended up treating our tables like pagan altars. So where? Okay, it's anywhere a group gather and who? We are utterly familiar with Christ as the high priest, because we take that from the letter to the Hebrews. But we're so 
anxious to get to the answer, we forget that the letter to the Hebrews then spends most of its time trying to prove how Jesus is a high priest. And the only answer you can come up with is he's a priest of the order of Melchizedek because we know nothing about Melchizedek, where he came from or who came after him. The Melchizedek story comes out of nowhere in the book of Genesis and goes nowhere. He's mentioned again once in the Psalms and that's it. In other words, Jesus didn't belong to any of the hereditary families that could generate the high priest. He wasn't even, a, he wasn't even in, on the fringes of the priesthood. And there's no emphasis in the early community on a need for a Levite. There's no emphasis on the need for a Kohen. The curious thing is, every Christian has this bizarre illusion that they can stand. We stand to pray, that's the priestly position. You find that in several places in the canonical text. And we address God directly as Father. That level of direct address to God presupposes that every one of us have immediate access to God. Now, of course, hey, hey, uh, you, I'm speaking to a Scottish audience. You, uh, you know, the, immediately the spectre of John Calvin comes up. Oh, dangerous. But, of course, what Calvin had spotted and spotted accurately was that the Christian community knew only one ritual which was demanded if one was to worship, and that was baptism. And of course, one of the strange things that will happen in later Christianity is that baptism becomes almost a bit like the foreword. You know, the, the bit in the book you skip over. Oh yeah, well, that's just the introduction. Skip that, let's get into the meat. And instead of baptism being the focus, order became the focus. But the who of the Eucharist is that it's any community of Christians. And again, that's subversive because <clears throat> states like to have structures and they know that religion is an element in every state. And so states like to have religion linked into state and they like to have, just as there's always a hierarchy in the state, they like a hierarchy in religion. It was that eminent atheist theologian, Frederick the Great, who said, religion is one of the most dangerous arms you can use in warfare. And so he wanted to control it. He said, if you're going into, if you invade a Catholic country, tell them you're there to liberate them from the Protestants. If you go into the Catholic, go into a Protestant country, tell them you're stopping the, the invasion by the Catholics. He was utterly cynical, but he recognized something about our human interaction with religion. We like our religion well-structured, and well controlled. And how often have you seen it? Um, you know, the mayor sits in the front seat, someone else sits then, and everyone likes to come along and be dressed in the correct kit. But the interesting thing about the Christian movement is that it sees itself as an egalitarian movement because each sister and brother can, through Christ, address the Father directly. And if you want to see that, the best place to look at is in the middle chapters of the Didache. 
a first century document. And then we look inside the community. This is the third point of subversion. And the curious thing is that the relationships within the community are to be characterized by being the first shall be last and the last shall be first and the greatest must be of the least. And if they want a model for their interrelationship, the model for interrelationship is that they are prepared to be unto one another as the lowliest household slave. And so it's not by accident that it's in the middle of the meal discourse in John that he introduces the story of washing feet. So any table can be the sacred place anywhere in the creation. And any of the baptized can address God as father and they are to relate to one another in terms of a community of mutual service. Now, of course, no such community has ever yet existed. But the fact that it doesn't exist doesn't take away from the reality that whether it's in terms of stories of the greatest shall be the least, or in terms of the image of performing the lowliest female servant's task in the form of John, that that is the vision that we're supposed to be celebrating in our Eucharist. There's a very funny story told about a, a film producer who had to produce a produce a play in Edinburgh on foot washing and it was called washing the s-o-l-e so he thought we'd better go along on holy thursday to the catholic cathedral and see how it was done and he saw the cardinal and the flunkies and the token things and he came out and he said that was very bad drama they cheated the audience what an interesting reflection on one of our central ceremonies on one of our central moments in the church's year he just went in to see how one group of performers did it and he felt they cheated the audience. We do not like the notion of being a community of supportive mutual relations. We would much rather be a neat, highly organized structure that can equiperate itself to the army, the navy, or the local corporation. And lastly, within that community, there was to be something radically subversive. Sadly, early Christianity does not take over any anti-slavery um, rhetoric. The Pharisees, from whom we take most of our, our moral theology is really in continuity with Pharisee theology, uh, the Pharisees had no anti-slavery uh, rhetoric. Uh, Paul worked with slaves, uh, borrowed slaves, and he just felt as long as you treated them well, that was it. And he, he writes famously about Onesimus in the letter to Philemon. The only community in the ancient world apart from the Stoics who did so on the basis of their belief that all creatures were equal insofar as all were far from God, but all were children of God. That's a, that was a philosophical view and it was, a, it was a view that was held, but it never took any practical uh, shape. Uh, 
you know, uh, there was a time when we used to read Cleanthes' hymn as the most beautiful piece of classical Greek from a religious point of view, but there is no evidence that Cleanthes' hymn ever made someone give up a slave. Uh, the only group who actually gave up slaves and believed that slavery was incompatible with the creator God were the Qumran community. And in the Qumran community, there is actually a developed theory of why slavery is incompatible with God. And you can read it in Philo's lovely little account. Philo also, Philo is probably the most eminent first century uh, common era theologian uh, that Judaism produced. In terms of his learning, he's far greater than Paul or any of the people who come and follow Jesus. And Philo has a lovely little book saying that every human being is created free. And it's an account of the doctrine of the Essenes. Now, the, the, he calls them the Essenes, we call them the Qumran community. And Jesus clearly is deeply influenced by this because in the meals, there is to be an equality where there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, but the key one is slave or free. And Paul has to give out to the community in Corinth, and this is in 58, only 20 years, 20, 30 years in, 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 into, in, into, the, into the, the work of the community of his followers, that they're importing into the Eucharist the social distinctions that are part and parcel of everyday life. The community meal as followers of Jesus was to be one where they were radically equal because they were all children of God. The, 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 the essence of the Qumran and had been made brothers and sisters through the work of the spirit. The unique insight of Jesus in that he calls God Father. And so we have a situation that at this meal, everyone is supposed to serve everyone else. God help us. The master might have to serve and wait on a woman slave. And of course, eventually this just was too much for the Christian church. Um, there is a school of theology that says, well, originally the, the, the Eucharist was sort of buried inside a meal and it, like, a, like, a, like a, a beautiful butterfly in a chrysalis and it had to break out of it. Oh, no, 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 no. That's just, uh, that's completely back to front thinking. No, originally it was a meal. And in the course of a community meal, we were Eucharistic. And for the meal to be genuine, it had to have this quality that we celebrated our radical equality with one another as children of the Father. And what happened was it was just socially too much for us. So what we did was we took the meal part and separated it. And then we just had a breakfast part. And we just, so what we did was, we didn't rescue the Eucharist. We just trimmed everything, but the bare necessity, the minimum amount. And even then drinking, drinking was too much. So we, we eventually phased that out because well, I might share my cup with some nice people of my, of, of my social, whom are my social equals. I'm not going to share it with that slobbery, smelly slave. 
So we, we took that away and we took bits of it away. So we have actually inherited uh, the dregs of the meal that Paul is giving out to the Corinthians that they're not celebrating justly. Four images, where did it take place? Who was there? How should they relate to one another? Were they equal or not? It's a new model of society because of course, for all of those authors, it wasn't an end in itself. It was the token of the new society when from east and west and north and south, people from every nation and place would be gathered together for the great banquet with Abraham of the kingdom of God. And I'll hand back to Callum or to you. Thank you very much, Tom. Without a doubt, um, lots and lots and lots there to ponder. And so I'll start just by giving you just, just a moment to, to consider the vastness of, of what Tom has just shared with us and to share your questions, reflections, comments, in the chat area. And Tom, just while others are doing so and gathering their thoughts, one of the things that, that you know, kind of really stayed with me from the last time that you were with us was the, the image of the Costa Cup, the, the sharing between, and I wonder if you might reflect a bit on that as well, and this idea that Gathering around the table is, is something about us sharing together. That's exactly the one. Yes. Uh, at a normal Jewish meal, there's a, you see the table is is the table is a very strange thing because the table creates equality which is why the table is such a good image for discussion because around the table, everyone is elbow to elbow, but there's always, there's all, in every formal meal, there is always someone who's leading the meal because otherwise well, we'd never move from one course to the next. And it was, it was always taken for granted that the leader of the meal would offer the Eucharistic prayer would offer the prayer of thanks. And the prayer at the beginning would be a thanksgiving for the meal. What would eventually end up as for us as grace before meals. And there we thank God for the creation and for the food and all of that. And then at the end, there will be another thanksgiving. And that was for the enjoyment of the meal. You thanked God for the fact that you'd had enjoyed the food, you'd enjoyed the cooking and you'd enjoyed the conversation. It had, been a, it had been a successful meal. And these two poles at either end of the meal become the basic symbolism that will identify this new community. And of course, the new community is characterized by the fact that they see themselves as linked together in that they're all part of a single body, which is the loaf. And they're all sharing the same lifeblood, which is the, 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 the cup that they share. And the sharing of the cup is utterly unique to the meal practice of Jesus. It just doesn't occur elsewhere. Thanks, Tom, um, for indulging my, my memory from your last time with us. Um, I want to turn now to the, the chat and Anne's question that comes in first says, you know, based on everything that you've shared with us tonight, 
why do we have priests at all? Well, we do. Well, you see, it depends on what you mean by the word priest. We don't have, we don't have priests in the sense that there were priests in the Old Testament who pray on behalf of us. The priest left the community and went into the sacred area and prayed on behalf of the people. And we don't have priests in the sense, so we don't have Kohenim. We don't have priests in that sense, nor do we have priests in the sense of sacerdotes in, 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 in Roman religion, where who do it on who do it who do it in a sense that you know the way you, you call the accountant to do the accounts, you call the auditor to do the audit, you call the engineer to do the something else, and you call the priest to do the religion bit. In Roman and Greek and Roman religion, you outsourced religion to an expert whom you paid, and they did that for you. But we actually have our presbyters. In other words, we have we have those who are. That's why we, you know, the presbyteral ordination. We have presbyters who lead us in prayer, and who give shape to our assembly and give voice to us because someone has to voice. But the problem is that um, we've tended to equiparate priest and clergy and officer corps. And then we have laity and they become non-priest and they become other ranks. And baptism is just sort of like, just, it's sort of like a basic ticket. And you see, then we, we then, we then start to create the situation where in the pre-1970 rite, the, the priest left the area of the community, went behind a, behind the rails, and the opening words on getting behind the rails were, I go unto the altar of God. A prayer that is, was out of the priestly liturgy of the temple where the priest had just left the people. Like, how many of us, and looking at the screen, several of us are old enough to remember this, the opening words of the Latin Mass, the old, the, the, the unreformed rite, in Troi Ibo ad Altara Dei, the, big, the opening words of Psalm 42. And it was, or, or not the opening words, but from Psalm 42. And it was wholly inappropriate because it presupposed that the priest was on behalf of. And then Later on, there was a prayer, take away from me my sins, O God, that I may enter with a pure heart into the Holy of Holies, as the priest went up the steps, which were also, the steps didn't belong to the Christ, they didn't belong to the Jewish temple, they actually belonged to a, a Roman temple. Uh, that's why they were, if you look at an old, an old, uh, an old building, um, it's actually modeled on a, on, a, on a Roman temple, the steps. So we have, we've actually an awful lot of baggage. So when people say, well, what is a priest? I say, mm, I don't like this word because it's, there's too much ambiguity. It can be a Christian presbyter. It can be a Roman priest, Greek or Roman priest. It can be a Jewish priest. Or it can be some sort of, I better not say porridge since this is a Scottish audience, but you know, a sort of a, a mush of bits and pieces of everything. And once it becomes a mush, baptism becomes irrelevant and suddenly you're into two-tier religion. Nice people, not nice people, clergy, laity, and on you go. 
So we don't need, we do not want priests, but what we do need is skilled presbyters so that wherever there's a community of Christians, there's someone who will help them to gather around a table and praise God. I think that image that you convey there, Tom, is a really powerful one, looking at the, the pre-Vatican II liturgy. And Jim in the chat suggests we, we've moved far from that original, that, that vision, if you like, of sharing around the table where it was very priestly focused. How have we come this far? Is it through that subversive approach? I Well, I hope we have moved, but unfortunately, I have to tell you that I know many I know many fellow presbyters who look back with longing and delight at that liturgy as somehow mystical and holy. And there are vast numbers of people who, when Pope Francis reversed what I think was a faulty decision by his predecessor to allow people to continue using that right, um, they, they, they kicked up merry hell. And I was speaking to a group of seminarians a few years ago, and they all wanted, they all wanted to learn how to celebrate the old rite. So I hope we, I don't think, I don't think intellectually, and no disrespect to anyone here, I don't think Catholics, I don't think Catholics have really realized just how serious the mess that Vatican II had to tackle. We never like, no one ever likes washing their linen in public. And we don't, we didn't like owning up to it. You know, there was, there's an element of the, the Boris Johnson about the way the thing, it was, the old thing was okay, but the other one is super okay. It wasn't wrong, but we're, you know, the means of, well, why change? Well, it was deadly wrong. The old right was very, and we have to, we, it's better if we own that because I think it will help us to renew our vision of what it is to be a baptized Christian today. Maybe turning, Tom, to the, the, the kind of practical considerations. Um, there's a comment in the chat saying, I'm struggling to translate the, the small Christian communities living in a relatively small place of equality and mutuality into a model that would work for the billions of people who practice worldwide now. How do we take that gathering around that table principle that worked for small communities okay. and apply it to a global church? Well, uh, what I would invite you to do is to go out to the Western Islands and pick up a one to 25,000 ordinance map, and then look at the number of church names that you will find in a very small area. And if you're in Britain, if you're in England, you can do this using the Doomsday Book. And just look at the number of church names and plot them on the map. And then find out how many people could that land in pre-agricultural revolution time support. And then measure the size of the churches. And you will find that they're tiny and yet they all had a priest. And the reason they all had a priest was, and this is how you get names like MacTaggart and MacPherson and uh, MacInespy and all that. Uh, they did exactly what the Greek church does. Uh, father, son followed father, learned the Latin from his father and then when father died, bishop came and ordained. So we have to realize that until quite late in the Middle Ages, particularly in places like Scotland, Ireland, and rural Spain, uh, you would have very small communities and because they, could, they, they couldn't travel. No, one is, no one's gonna get up early on a Sunday morning and travel more than a mile or two to, to to get to mass. So you have very small churches and oh yes, they paid tithes, but they went to the bishop. 
the, the, the poor old cleric, he had to, he had to, he had the glee plans. He actually had to get out and do a day's work. If there's a community of Christians, it's not beyond the wit of human beings to find one of them who actually has the skills to lead. And then the bishop has to come along and ordain. And you say, that never. That's what the Greeks do. That's, that still happens in rural Greece. And Tom, we've spoken a lot already and the, the volume of questions coming in is fantastic and the quality of the questions coming in is incredible. But we've spoken already in, in the, the brief conversation we've had so far about the role of the priest. I want to stay with that theme just a moment with this next question, which asks, how do you see the development of the idea of the celebrant being in persona Christi? And how did the earliest Eucharistic communities identify that presence individually and collectively? They, the way they probably, the, the, the first I'll answer is we are not, we do not know because they were so uninterested in admin structures that it's well into the third century before we can, re before we really move beyond the guesswork stage. Uh, in fact, some would even say it's the early fourth century and, and, this, and, a, and a, spa, a document from Spain known as the, the Acts of the Synod of Elvira. But it seems to work something like this. Whoever had the largest house was the one who hosted the gathering. And the gathering, and it was probably that person who led the, who led the meal. And you say, but you wouldn't have the skills. Well, it doesn't take that much skills to learn how to, how to, how to lead a gathering in prayer. And many of the early communities that we call Christians are actually Jews who are following Jesus. And one of the ideal skills that a Jewish boy learned was how to compose a Eucharistic prayer. In fact, in the book of Sirach, there's, there's a piece of very useful advice, which I, I think should be also applied to sermons. It says, if you're a young person and you're called on to Say the, say the blessing at a meal. Remember, there are more skilled people there who are older than you, so don't show off. And remember, don't take too long because people are hungry. So there were this, the basic set of skills, the real skill you need to be a presider is to be the sort of person that makes people gather and have a good experience of fellowship with other human beings and a sense of vision and shared vision and that God loves you. Now that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a human skill that, that you, you spot it. And then we do know that there were specialists going from church to church and they were giving, they were, some of them were prophets, some were called, they were all generically called apostles. An apostle is someone who goes from who's sent from one place to the next. And we, 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 know, the, we know the names and they're, they're, you know, we, we know a husband and wife team of apostles, Prisca and Aquila. Uh, we know at the end of the letters to the Romans that uh, Paul talks about the, the, the first among the apostles that he knows in Rome is a woman, Junia. So we know there are people going from church to church and they're, they're, able, they're able to give something like the sermon. They're able to give you, they're able to give you teachings and they have other skills and they actually have to be supported. And then of course, the highest skill was someone who could actually give you, give you a performance of the gospel. And that's a gospeler. And what a gospel is, a gospel is the text that comes from a gospeler and the gospeler moves from church to church giving a performance. So we have to think of the community as if you, there is a tiny little peninsula off the, off, 
off the Long Peninsula on Mull, and there's a tiny little church on it, or the ruins of a church. And it, it's just come back into my memory now because I'm talking to the Scottish laity network. It wouldn't have come into my mind if I were talking to the Cornwall laity network. Now, there was clearly a small community of farmers on that little peninsula on a peninsula. There was someone there who actually could organize that group and gather them. Now that's the, that is the, that's the presiding skill. That's the presbyteral skill. They look to this person as the decent character who could give shape to their prayer. And then it was the bishop's job to come and ordain. And so link that person with the whole work of the, of the great church, the Oikoumene. Staying with the theme, Tom, of, of the priest, the presbyter, the, the individual leading, I know you've spoken already about the idea of it perhaps being the largest house and the householder there led, but is there any evidence in the early communities that they would have discerned who had the skills to lead? Uh, there is not, uh, there, the, unfortunately, there isn't a single shred of information until well into the fourth century as to desirable qualities. I suspect that it was those who could did and those who couldn't let the others get on with it. Uh, we do know, however, but don't let's think that it was all nice. We do know, everyone knows about apostles, they're nice people, but there were also Christ talkers and the the uh, Chris Emperoi, and they were they were they, the Christ hawkers were peddling Christianity, and they were collecting food, and they were collecting money, and they were charging for their services. And so, one of the things the communities had to do was they had to develop rules so that you would know. It doesn't say how you chose a prophet. It says if a prophet arrives in your church and the first vision he gets is that you should lay on a meal for him treat him as a false prophet <clears throat> if an apostle arrives in your church well you've got to feed him and keep him for three days and then give him enough food to get to the next place well that's decent now that's you know that's that, that's what we call expenses but if they stay longer than three days Make sure they work for them. Make sure they, they get to work. And Paul, always wanting to be one up on the churches he's going to give out to in his letters, he points out that he doesn't rely on his rights to get food. And he never takes any money, lest anyone would accuse him of, of, of taking backhanders. And he's very proud of the fact that he lives when he's in Ephesus for several months, he lives using his skills. And that raises, well, why, well, what's the advantage for someone like Paul of being a tent maker? Well, it was Jeremy Murphy O'Connor who pointed out, can you imagine if Paul were a carpenter? How would he travel from, travel from church to church, carrying a big, look? you know, the old fashioned wooden car box a carpenter carried? But what do you need? What, what do you need to be a tent maker? You need a scissors and a set of needles. You can carry them in a little thing hanging on your belt. So just think of we think of Paul as sort of sitting at his computer, you know, what's the next bit of the letter to the Romans? I want you have to think of him as traveling from church to church and rather than being beholden to the church, even to the extent that it's customary for travelers in a church to be beholden, he, he wants to be his own man. I certainly wouldn't like to have met Paul. He strikes me as the, the you know, the, 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 the guest, the, the, the guest that you really do want to say goodbye to. Uh, 
But Paul, Paul can be completely independent of the churches precisely because he can earn his skill because he can take all his working tools, his scissors, he needs, a, he needs a scissors, he needs a piece of string as a measuring thing, and he needs needles. He can carry them all in a small pouch. And there's another very interesting way you know about how the importance of travelers in the early churches. If you make a list of all of the places mentioned in the New Testament in the Greco-Roman world, so leave aside Palestine, Virtually all of them can be got to by a ferry. Think about it. Every town you can name in Greece as an early church is on the ferry service. So they arrive, preach, get back on the ferry and off to the next place. I want to turn now, Tom, um, to, to the idea of baptism, which you spoke about. And I wonder if you can say a bit more about the importance of baptism and perhaps this question of, is it about who is gathering at the table? They, one can't emphasize, we're not individuals before God. We're a community of individuals before God. We, we're, we are a family, we are a, we are a people, and baptism is the entry into that family. Now, I was 10 days old when I was baptized, and, you know, I've, uh, I have no sense of it, uh, except that I, the first time my baptism came into my consciousness was was the first time I had to collect a, a, a baptismal certificate, probably for my confirmation. Um, but it is baptism that incorporates us into the community and the community is incorporated into Christ. So, Christ, so baptism incorporates us into Christ. And there's a whole set of images and no one's, if, if we look through the first two centuries, there's baptism as rebirth, baptism as dying and rising, baptism as washing, baptism as purification, baptism as a marker that marks you in as, it's all of those things because it is baptism that sets us off on this trajectory that we hope will end in the kingdom of God. And the, it's in reflecting on baptism that we discover the challenge of Christian life, the nature of the church, and also the nature of the relationship of Christ with us. And then staying with this idea of, of, of the centrality of baptism and this equality of those gathered around the table, um, I wonder if I can turn to this question around, do, do we need to re-intentionalise the inclusive nature of the Eucharist through the return of, for example, divorced and remarried, um, those quote unquote, living outside of the churches, teaching, for example, LGBT people, do we need to, to reconsider this whole issue um, and focus on the inclusivity of the Eucharist instead? Well, uh, in fact, the, uh, um, someone in Rome was, was, gave a big speech on, on the need for this just a couple of days ago. And uh, I downloaded it as one does and said, and then I made a little note, read this. And I read the first paragraph and said, oh yeah, I'll re read that. So this is actually one of, the, this, is, this is one of the hot topics. Think of the Eucharistic stories in the gospel. Oh, Last Supper, yeah. Very clearly a Eucharistic story. 
The meal in the Pharisee's house, yes, clearly a Eucharistic story in the broader sense. Uh, the meal in Simon's house, yes, clearly, clearly a Eucharistic story. The picnic feedings, yes, Eucharistic dimension. But think of the, think of two stories that we think of as forgiveness stories rather than Eucharistic stories. There's the story of Zacchaeus. It's not Zacchaeus, uh, I'm going to reveal to you your sins uh, and then we'll see what we're going to do about it. It's, it's, it's not sort of being brought before the magistrate. The greeting is Zacchaeus, I will eat with you tonight. And the last phrase in the prodigal son story, it's now let it's translated as let us celebrate. It's actually let us eat together. Uh, if God is infinitely merciful and that mercy is seen in his banquet, uh, we have to see the banquet as the primary place where we discover the mercy of God. It really isn't nice buns for nice children. And yet, deep in our psyche, we see the Eucharist as a reward. Now, of course, recently, um, uh, I, I read somewhere saying this is soppy liberal theology. I won't. It was a very eminent churchman who said this was soppy eminent uh, liberal theology. But uh, we, uh, well, it was Aquinas who said we come to the meal as a sick person to the physician. Now that's yeah. You know, I, I meant to hang the phone up. I'm just going to ignore that. Excuse me. And it'll go. Oh, I knew the, I, people would give up. Uh, they, um, I can no more exclude someone from a meal than I can be the first person throwing the stone. That's a that's an image or a, a quote, Tom. That's certainly going to to stay with me from tonight. I, I can no more exclude someone from the meal than throw the first I'm stone. Sure. I'm having my own technical problems here. That's my uh, smart speaker deciding to talk back to me in the background. Um, I, I want to then turn from from that notion of us gathered around a table and and then ask the question: How did we get so far removed from honouring those around the table? And end up with with where we are now and and it, within that I, I wonder tom if you can reflect on the idea of eucharistic adoration as well uh, can i be can i can i do something that's that's actually can i cheat here and say look you don't get from a to b ever in theology you get you get through a thousand little tiny steps and what you've Done is you've said there's step one and there's step Z. But there aren't 26 steps. There's a thousand and twenty-six steps. And some of them are tiny and some of them are big. I'll give you a I'll give you, I'll give you one of the big ones, and then I'll give you one of the tiny ones, right? Can you imagine? Mass without a consecration. Oh, no. Well, since 2001, there is a doctrinal decision taken, signed by John Paul II, composed by Cardinal Ratzinger, pointing out that the East Syrian Rite, 
which never had a consecration prayer. It has only a Eucharistic prayer. There's no words. There's no take this all of you and eat it. There's nothing like that. Is a valid Eucharistic prayer. As one guy said, it's good to know the Syrians haven't been firing blanks for 1800 years. Now, why someone in the third century decided to historicize a prayer to the father by talking to the congregation is a good question. I like to think that he was a, 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 a communicating fellow and I said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain it to you guys. And he did it for very good reasons. But the effect was to take the focus off the father, we come to you father, we took the focus off the father and we turned it on to changing something. Now that's the big one. But thank God, since 2001, we've put our hands up and we've said, the prayer of Adai and Mary is just as good as our prayers, which is a good thing to have said, since their prayers are older than any of ours. And here's a tiny one. Oh, there's an even nicer one. An even nicer one. There was a nutty Archbishop of Paris in 1215, whose name I've forgotten. But he heard that some of the priests had decided to hold up the host over their heads so that the people back in the church could see it. And he said, if you're going to start worrying about the people in the church, you won't be con concentrating on what you should be doing. Stop it at once. But the boys didn't. So we now cannot imagine the Latin rite without an elevation. And then someone said, well, if we've done it with the host, we better do it with the chalice. even though you can only see metal. Recently I was in a, recently I was at an Anglican Eucharist and the guy who was presiding like a real genius and you know, hates all this de defective stuff that came in. Sure enough, he had an elevation. I thought, by God, I'll get this guy at coffee. And I really loved rubbing it in. I said, I said, I, I notice, uh, you were using, you're using a very old Eucharist. Oh yes, yes, yes. I said, can you explain why you had these Paris inventions from the period between 1215 and 1230? Oh gosh, it was, it was, it was delightful to get one up on them like that. And then here's the silly one. How many of you have heard the little bell ringing at the or at, uh, at the, um, when the priest puts his hands over, over, over the offerings. We all know that. It must be terribly important. And so it was so terribly important, we rang it again at the elevation, and we rang it again at the second elevation. And then we rang it a fourth time as the priest was eating, eating, consuming his two halves of the, of the loaf. Why do we ring bells? The reason we, we introduce the ringing of bells in the Eucharistic prayer, which could only serve to distract the priest. I'm sure some of the older ones of us here uh, can remember that there were priests that just, just a bare tinkle, it distracts me. I remember being told by a very holy priest when I was a little boy to barely tinkle the bell because it distracted him. And I did. I must say, it annoyed me because I loved making a rattle with the big with the bell. The reason, of course, we rang the bell was to tell the damn organist to get the choir to shut up, because they were singing the Sanctus until you rang the bell, and then when you rang it after the second elevation, they took off on on the Benedictus. And then we rang the fourth bell to tell people they could now leave because the priest had gone to communion. And once the priest had gone to communion, 
the ritual was complete except for the tail ends. And so the last spell was the only one that was intended for the, the laity. Now, that's not how the bells are understood. And you go into any Catholic church on Sunday morning, the choir hasn't sung during the Eucharistic prayer for the last 50 years. The organ doesn't play during the Eucharistic prayer. Uh, and yet the kids are still ringing the bells. We're ringing the bells to tell, a, to tell an organist during high mass in the 16th century to get the choir to shut up. So there's too many little steps and big steps. It's a long, complex story. And we've inherited the good things and the bad things. Tom, but before um, I put my next question to you, I, I wonder, would you mind if I go on for a little bit? We, we have such a volume of questions. Would you mind if I take this to half past? Would that be all right with yourself? Okay. Okay, let's take it at half past. I, I want to, we've spoken a bit about those excluded from the table there. And, and I want to take a very contemporary example from the chat here and ask, what does the, the bishops in America, their decision about Nancy Pelosi reflect um, of the Eucharist, what, what does it say? Well, I, again, uh, can I just say that I wrote an article on that uh, a few months ago when this was first mentioned, and I published it uh, in, in La Croix, where I said, don't, you must, you must never use God's grace as a weapon. And I don't know the, I, I don't know, I've, I've, I've never met the, the the bishops concerned. I don't know what they're in, what the, what's going on inside their heads. But whenever you take on a, whenever you take on a public role, you have to be aware that your actions could be interpreted in a way that is contrary to the gospel. And insofar as their actions could be interpreted, that the Eucharist is a reward for what they consider good behavior or a reward for any particular action, then they're weaponizing the means of grace. You don't weaponize the mercy of God because we're now turning the divine mercy and the love which sustains the creation into, uh, well, it's, it, 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 you see, see, see this is, this, if, if once you start thinking in those lines, you, you're actually using the same thought process as someone like Vladimir Putin. You know, nice, you know, what is this? Uh, nice children deserve favor. Uh, Bold children get no sweets. Uh, this is not what it's about. If God is, if, 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 if the Almighty, blessed be He, is so antagonized by all of this, He'll just wipe, He could just wipe these miscreants off the face of the earth. But if God loves them enough to leave them there, it behoves us to respect that love and share that love with them. And, I, oh, there is, there is, of course, the, 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 old, the old thing about um, that it's, it's, going to give, it's going to give scandal. Uh, well, I, you know, scandal cuts both ways. It might be scandalous, in in one bishop's eyes, but it's certainly scandalous in another. That it's certainly scandalous in my eyes. That the gifts of God for the people of God are being measured out as if the church owns them. We we're ministers of of the mysteries. We're not producers or owners of the mysteries. 
That's not a direct answer, but a longer answer is in an article I wrote on Lacroix when this was first mentioned last year. Tom, there's there's so many directions that I could take the conversation in. Um, and there's a whole conversation going on in the chat about why bells are wrong. You've started a, a completely oh, separate I know, conversation. I know, I know. It's, it's, um, yes, it's, uh, it, it, there, there's a whole mythology uh, around the importance of bells. But uh, that's why they were, um, that's why they were, that, that's where, the, 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 that's why it was a little, it's just a little, the notice bell. <laughs> Let, let's look back to baptism though. Uh, reflecting on some of your comments earlier, there's a question here that says, should baptism be a, a conscious choice? Would it be better to dispense with infant baptism, you know, have a naming ceremony or something like that for a child as a first step, but bring baptism, focus that on, on those who are older to make that decision? Well, in de facto, that's what's happening. Because um, we're... The, we're 30 years ago, the pastoral wisdom was if they, if people came for baptism, you should see it as an opportunity to evangelize and see could you draw them into the life of the community. And, but in fact, we're, the situation we're in today, certainly in, certainly in Britain, is that Baptism is increasingly a choice. And I know many of my friends who've had their children baptized, and I've baptized them. Uh, and then they have the agony of watching out and watching them uh, decide, for, decide for themselves and going their own way. So, I think we I think we talk about the, the infant baptism question often using out of date models of what's happening in our society. Um, I was listening to a relative of mine recently talking to her daughter and she says you have to go to mass until you get to confirmation then it's up to you. Now of course the idea that it's that you have to do something is itself a problematic issue. But equally, joining with a group for a meal is something where we, we drift away from our families and then we drift in and we form more, we form new communities. And so we, we actually have to take a very hard look at what's happening in our society and then decide whether we're going to we're going to we're going to see what's the best way for actually realizing that faith is a decision. Remember that you say, oh, well, that's that's you know we we don't want to go back to Baptist theology or Anabaptist. Look, forget about forget about the arguments from the 16th century. To my mind, the fundamental difference between our moment and the moment of my mother and father and even of my own childhood is this. We are the first generation for whom religion is an option. Previous generations, they may have hated religion, they may have turned against religion, but religion was a fact in their lives. Religion is no longer a necessary fact in anyone's life in this country. And therefore religion is, 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 is an option. And our pastoral practice has to reflect the fact that people are choosing to believe. And our pastoral practice then has to facilitate everyone who is searching to discover in our community not something we want to sell them, but something that will fulfill them in their own search. 
And one final question then with my apologies to everyone whose question I've not been able to include tonight. There's been such a, a, a vast quality and quantity of questions. But one final question to, to tie it up. How is it possible then to create such communities as those that you have spoken about today within the current structures, within the current structures and understanding of theology within the church? You spoke, for example, about the elevation, you know, within the rubrics. That, what, are, what can we do with the current situation? Uh, well, what we have to do is remember that there's no such thing as um, human beings are not naturally revolutionary, so we don't ever change from one thing to the other. Um, it was a it was my fellow Irishman Edmund Burke who predicted that having created the revolution of 1789, there would very shortly arise a new king, and that king would be uh, would be a would be a dictator. And he, he predicted that four years before the, the rise of Napoleon. So I don't believe in revolutions. Human beings change slowly and we change in incremental steps. And it's to have a vision of the end. And then from my point of view, to keep asking yourself, is this the best way to there? and then just take the next step. Um, so hardly any church now has altar boys uh, or altar servers or anything like that. So one of the reasons the bells stayed was the kids loved ringing them. So that's a very simple way of getting rid of that. Uh, discover discover how our own, on a, on a greater scale, adult faith hardly ever exists, in fact, it never exists as just my, 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 my activity, my belief. Realize that Robinson Crusoe is a deeply anti-Christian image. We grow and we discover in community. And the more trusting relationships we have in the community around us, the deeper we will grow in faith. Uh, when, when the Alpha program started up, I was intrigued by the fact that this 20 years ago now or more even, there was, it was essential to have a common meal in the plan but there was no mention of Eucharist but they had rediscovered that in just being together people deepened their faith and then there was a Catholic version I looked at it and it had a big section one sixth of it was on Eucharist but it had made the meal optional <coughs> How interesting. One group had no theology, well, they had the meal. The other had the meal, the other had the theology and no meal. So we all have to take little steps, but it's in community that faith is sustained and deepened and the ramifications of faith discovered. Tom, thank you very much for our conversation. I think I said the last time when you were with us, and I'll say it again, you have certainly given us lots to think about and lots to reflect on. I'm going to hand over to Hugh, who'd like to say a few words of thanks. <clears throat> I think it's almost impossible to try and encapsulate in a couple of minutes <laughs> the journey that we've just been on. Um, I'm hugely grateful to Tom for his Edition, but also I think as a community, I think what's happened tonight is a, 
an ability to take the theme and engage in a dialogue with Tom that ironically fed everybody who chose to be here. And I think that understanding of the Eucharist as a collective practice, as a counter-cultural rea reality that comes from a place where Eucharist challenged the very fabric of what it meant to be a citizen even, is something that we probably have to rediscover as we continue our journey of synodality. Um, I'd like to, to actually pray for Tom if that's possible. And, I don't know if there's a slide, Callum, but I'm happy just to read it. So Tom, we'd like to offer a prayer for you this evening. Loving God, we thank you for the insight, wisdom and passion of Tom. We thank you for what he has shared with us tonight. We ask that you anoint him anew such that his life and his ministry may continue to be empowered by your spirit. Amen. Thank you, Hugh. And now we'll offer a prayer for the Zavarian missionaries. God of creation, we thank you for the Zavarian missionaries. We ask that you empower them in their work of interfaith dialogue advocacy for and solidarity with the poor, intercultural dialogue in pastoral assistance in international cultural communities. Amen. And now as we come to the end of the formal part of our evening, we are going to say the prayer to the Holy Spirit so that we might go forth empowered by the Spirit. And this is the prayer which was written by our friend Demeter Merku. Come, Holy Spirit, breathe down upon our troubled world. Shake the tired foundations of our crumbling institutions. Break the rules that keep you out of all our sacred spaces and from the dust and rubble, gather up the seedlings of a new creation. Come Holy Spirit, inflame once more the dying embers of our weariness. Shake us of our complacency. Whisper our names once more and scatter your gifts of grace with wild abandon. Break open the prisons of our inner being and let your raging justice be our sign of liberty. Come Holy Spirit and lead us to places we would rather not go. Expand the horizons of our limited imaginations. Awaken in our souls dangerous dreams for a new tomorrow and rekindle in our hearts the fire of prophetic enthusiasm. Come, Holy Spirit, whose justice outwits international conspiracy, whose light outshines spiritual bigotry, whose peace can overcome the destructive potential of warfare, whose promise invigorates our every effort to create a new heaven and new earth now and forever. Empowered by the Spirit, we continue the mission entrusted to us. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Now, next Thursday is the rearranged final version of our Lenten journey. And we're welcoming back Dimitar Merku, who will speak on sexuality and spirituality. It's the final session of the 
body of Christ blessed, broken and excluded. The link to register for this was included in the email that you got for tonight's session. And this is something else you might be interested in, Pax Christi. Uh, challenging the hostile environment on Monday, the 13th of June. There's also details about that in the email that you got this evening. And then Quest have got a conversation between two of our previous companions, Jim Martin and George White. They are going to talk about what does it mean to be an LGBT plus inclusive gospel led Catholic school in the UK. And again, you've got details of that. And finally, you'll be glad to hear that word, I think. Finally, we're going to have a, a Scottish Laity Network gathering. It will be on Thursday, the 23rd of June. We warmly invite you to come to that. It's an opportunity where we can share our ideas and our insights and where we want to go. You'll get more information about that shortly. For the present, just note the date, Thursday, the 23rd of June. So thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you, Hugh and the Zavarian missionaries. If you're leaving us now, good night, God bless, please log off. If you want to stay on, you can join a breakout room, just stay connected and RAB will organize the breakout rooms. <laughs>